In this session on GS240 Data Science for Geoscience, I'll provide a brief introduction to multiple point geostatistics. So uh, for that, I refer to the book, uh, which I think covers most of uh, what multiple point geostatistics is and, and what's going on in that field. And there's also the first paper, sort of application paper of that, um, which is still, I think, quite insightful, and particularly for those uh, working in, in subsurface and earth resources. So the first thing we have to we can talk about is why do we need multiple point geostatistics and why not just stick with paragram based geostatistics, which is most of what we've covered so far. To illustrate that, imagine here a case where you have quite limited sample data. Say you have drilled 30 wells or you went in the field and collected 30 samples. And then on the right hand side or here on the what comes next, we notice that we have built different numerical models, and all these numerical models are matching the data equally well. So based on the information itself, we can't um, really, let's you know, say, um, reject any of these models. And furthermore, if we would calculate the variogram of all these models, they all looked very much the same. We have some kind of a geometric anisotropy, and you could say if I have noisy variogram data, which would come from those 30 sample data, then I would not be able to distinguish between those uh, three models. So what this shows is that the variogram is, is only presents limited information on the spatial characteristics. And of course, when you have limited sample data, that's pretty much the only thing you can calculate. And so what we'd like to do now is something very different. We'd like to do something where we can now control better the type of um, spatial patterns that we generate beyond something that's uh, variogram based. In fact, if you use SGSIM, or truncated Gaussian simulation. So truncated Gaussian simulation, you would get this kind of model. You would never get these models. And so sometimes we have a priori information about the nature of what our patterns look like, and so we would like to include that a priori information into our modeling. There are also other limitations of the Gaussian approaches. It's I, I, I like to call it a very data-driven approach in the sense that, imagine here the situation at the bottom where we have Orca Lake. And if you use now, very densely sampled data, which means 5% of the whole area covered. So we have about 78,000 uh, 78, pixels here, 5% of those pixels are informed, then we get something that resembles the Walker Lake. But as we go and decrease the amount of samples, you see this kind of what I, fall, what I call uh, falling apart or destructuring of, of, of what you see in, in, in uh, compared to reality, which is very structured. You don't see, you get this noisy uh, kind of behavior and that has to do with the fact that the Gaussian distribution has a very thin tail it means that there the, the and also that the extremes are rapidly becoming very uncorrelated now if I would calculate the variogram however uh, on all these information I would still find they have very similar variograms so again it shows that the variograms uh, do not provide a complete picture on the nature of spatial variability what do I want well, a simple problem here with many applications. Suppose I'm giving, again, this data. You can imagine the data that we saw, the 30 sample data as before, and can calculate. If I calculate a variogram, I get pretty much nothing because um, there's so few information. But somebody tells me and provides me uh, through an image, and of course in 3D, this would be a 3D uh, model, uh, provides me what, what they would expect to see in this, uh, say, this area. For example, this area, they expect to see some kind of fluvial system or embraided system, uh, and so we're expecting to see these continuous channels. And instead of then running SGSIM or another program I, or calculating variograms, I'd like to have a, a method that can do that for me, a method that can reproduce these kind of structures, but at the same time is also constrained to these observations. For example, where I have channel here, I will have channel in all of these uh, images. And so that is something uh, that we'd like to do. And that is called um, basically geostatistics with training images. So we provide additional information in, in, in terms of images or exhaustive data sets. Uh, it doesn't have to be an image, it could also be an exhaustive data set uh, that allows us to create these realizations and be constrained to the data. So you can imagine this has a number of applications, um, certainly in the subsurface modeling, oil and gas mining, uh, groundwater. People have uh, analog observations. They go to outcrops, they um, create databases of, of object shapes and geometries. And so that information needs to be used in some sense in creating subsurface models. But also in remote sensing and climate modeling, there's many models that are being created 
And so from these models that we've created, we can learn a lot of information spatially, and we can use that information in, in order to make predictions. So how do we do this? Uh, how do we get to that uh, method whereby we can simulate patterns that are similar to a training image? And the way we'll do it is very much like we did for sequential Gaussian simulation, is we're going to um, use this idea of sequential simulation. So imagine you have a training image here, and you have a two by two grid. So that's just a kind of a simple example to illustrate the concept. So what I'd like to do is to create a program that can simulate the patterns that we see here. And of course, the answer you already know, uh, there's only two possible patterns that you can simulate, which is black, black, and white, white. Or if I look here, it would be, let's say, I look here, it would be white, white, and black, black. So how can we do this automatically? Um, the way we do it is sequential simulation, which means we create a random pass. So we pick a cell. That cell, we ask, what is the probability of having black in that cell? Well, right now we don't know anything except, for example, that I have about the equal amount of black pixels versus white pixels. So you could say I assign probability here of 50%. Then I do uh, Monte Carlo and I get this. So this is very much sim similar to sequential Gaussian simulation, except for in sequential Gaussian simulation, we did Kriging, calculated the conditional distribution, which is normal with using our Kriging information, and drew a value from it. So now we go to do the same thing. We randomly pick another location. So imagine that's the location over here. And we assign a probability to that. But now, of course, I know that it's 100% certain to be black. And so if I simulate that, I will get that answer. And of course, now everything else is certain. I will get that. So if you change the random paths and if, or you change the drawing uh, of this distribution, and I could also generate this realization. And you would actually find that if you repeat this many, many times, say 100 times, and on average, we'll find 50 times this model and 50 times that model. So that's basically the real, really the idea uh, that's behind it. And now we'll see how we can go to implement it in practice, when in practice we have large grids, we have all kind of other information, and we potentially have very large training images. Okay, so the way it works in practice is um, that we're going to need to do some scanning. So for example, imagine a simulation that you're in a grid and you have a number of information around you. For example, you have blue values and, and yellow values, and blue values indicate that you have channels, and yellow values indicate that you're not in channels. And suppose that I take, uh, again, so as before, I'd like to know what's over here. So before we did Kriging, we did Gaussian simulation, et cetera. Now we, we're not doing that. Instead, we're looking at, again, a neighborhood. So that's going to be remain the same. You still have a, a local neighborhood, and you collect what's over there in that local neighborhood. And so then what you're going to do, we call this now the data event. So I have four pixels around this red pixel. I'm going to go in my image and I search in this image where I find replicates, where I find patterns are exactly the same as the patterns in this uh, that I have here. And so, for example, what we see here is that indeed I find four. Let's imagine I found four. And for those four, I have three times blue and four times uh, and one times yellow. So simply the probability of the center being blue, given the four data that I have, is 0 0.75. So once I have that, I draw a value here, assign it to this grid location, and I move to the next grid location where I do the exact same operation. So the previous thing we were doing, um, obviously it's not going to work very well when we have large grids and large training images, because we'll have to scan the training image anew every time we want to simulate an event. And that seems a little bit of a waste of time. Um, what we'll try to do instead is to build up a database of the various probabilities such that when we have that database, we can retrieve the probability we'd like to have once we start simulating a node at a specific location. And so this idea um, is uh, implemented in what is called a search tree and a search template. And so since the search template is the one that's used in, in the implementation, uh, I'll go over uh, this a little bit and uh, go over a little bit over what this um, search template is and what influence it has on the results. So to explain the search template, uh, I'll uh, cover a particular example. So we here have a training image. And suppose we have a simple search neighborhood. So our simple search neighborhood is the, the point you want to simulate and then the four closest ones. So I will discard everything else that's not in that search neighborhood. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan out this training image with the search neighborhood, but in a, in very, in, in a very different fashion uh, or in a very specific fashion. The first thing I'd like to store at the top of my search tree is the proportions of the yellow and, and the uh, white. So that's like retaining only the center node. So if it's a scan with the center node, I'll find 14 white and 11 uh, yellow. So then I will look now at uh, this node and the node, the first node. So I look at the pattern. How many patterns do I have? White, 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 yellow, yellow, white, and yellow, yellow. So the way that's done in the search tree is divide us up into what if one is white and what if one is yellow. So that is what you see over here. For example, uh, the pattern white, yellow uh, occurs here. One, here, two, three, four, five. So I have five of those. Uh, and in a total, I have eight. Okay, uh, so and then go on with that. Now I take my second one. Uh, for example, um, if I look at the second one and we look at white, white, yellow, uh, I'll find white, white, yellow, and that will be only one pattern there, and so on. Now you'll start to notice that after a while, uh, I may not find events, right? So all the combinations that I have, which is a lot of combinations, are, do not necessarily occur in a training image, and so I just don't store those. Um, so for example, uh, these patterns are, are not stored. So what now determines the size of the search tree? Well, first of all, um, what's important is the number of categories, right? Because if you have three categories, I will have to store three numbers, four categories, four numbers, and then of course, that has to cascade through this entire tree. And so that's why um, this tree will, will grow exponentially with the number of categories. Then also uh, what's important is the size of the search template. So the larger the size of the search template, the larger uh, the tree uh, will become. And then of course the complexity of the training image. My training image just consists of yellow lines. Then I will have very replications of our patterns, different patterns in my training image. And so the search neighborhood uh, will essentially uh, remain uh, very small. Okay, so then you also mentioned, yeah, that's great, but uh, in reality, I, I have more complicated situations. Uh, for example, what if the situation like this, I'd like to know what is the probability of having a white cell here given a white cell over there that doesn't sit in my search tree because I always go in the order one, two, three, four, etc. So the way that is done is by marginalization. You just sum up over the possibility of all the other possibilities. And so that's an extra operation that will take an extra amount of time if you want to do that. So this essentially the probability of that is the sum of this probability plus the sum of that probability. If you have something missing, for example, if you're in your simulation grid, you say, I'd like to know the probability of this being yellow given these are all yellow and it's not in your search tree. What you then do is you drop the, the furthest node and you check whether that's in your search tree. Uh, if that would not be in your search tree, you drop again a node and so on. And so in this case, we can just rely on the probability for this particular pattern. Okay, what about spatial continuity at larger scale? If you have really large training image and large simulation grid, you may end up using very large templates because if you have large continuity in your training image, you'd like to capture that. So to do that, you would have to use a very large template. So the way that is done is by means of what's called multiple grid simulation. What we do is we have a cascading set of grids, a coarse grid and then a finer grid on which we first simulate on the coarse grid. So uh, what we do is we simulate on a coarse grid with a fairly coarse template, say a three by three template, and we get the simulation that looks like this. And once we have that simulation, we paste that values on the finer grid. And so we have this fine grid here, which is now denser. Uh, and we have already values. So the, 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 large, the large scale continuity is already uh, informed. And so what we then use is a fine scale template um, to, to make that, uh, to do that simulation. What if you already have some information a priori in terms of probabilities? Well, what if I, for example, have, instead of this two by two grid being empty, I already have probabilities. So what we do then is uh, we do the same procedure, but now we have to merge two probabilities. We have a probability that has to do with um, the training image. And a prob for example, if I did not have the probability um, of 0 0.8, then the assign I would say assign a probability of 0 0.5. So now I have a probability of 0 0.5 and a probability of 0 0.8. 
So in order to uh, merge those two, I use the model that we discussed in the spatial aggregation uh, session where we talked about probability aggregation. We said that if, if something is more certain, uh, being closer to one, then the probability that will win is that certain probability. So the marginal probability on 0 0.5. So what you, of course, not do is just average probabilities. And that's something we discussed in the session on spatial data aggregation. So the probability that will win is a probability 0 0.8 and so on. Uh, and I draw then, for example, a black. Once I have a black, I have now here followed the next node. Uh, now I have again two probabilities. Probability, say, here, 0 0.3 and probability of 100%, which was the one derived from the training image. So I have to combine one, 0 0.3 and, uh, and 100%. And so, of course, I get 100% is the answer, and that will be my probability. So in general, it would work as follows. You have three probabilities, uh, which the prior probabilities is the one that is the proportion from the training image. You have some kind of soft probability, and you have some kind of training in this derived probability. And so you will have to combine these into a single probability. And that's where we use our conditional independence assumption and our probability aggregation model that was covered in previous lectures. Okay, so here we have the first uh, sort of ever case study with MPS. This concerned a turbidite reservoir where we would like to simulate a sand, a sand shale uh, system. So what information do we have? We have information from wells. So, so imagine doing variable-based geostatistics, for example, with four bit points. It's very, very difficult to do. We have also a seismic amplitude data set, uh, namely a 3D seismic data set. And we have some um, similar a prior understanding of some geometries, namely turbidite channels uh, that are occurring. So we build us up a, a, a grid. So you know this in practice, you know, these grids can get large. Uh, and this is the grid uh, resolution. So the first thing we do is generate our training image. And there are many ways to do that. Um, often people use uh, object-based uh, methods. These are methods that basically place objects in a 3D space that have certain properties, such as certain geometries or certain uh, attractions or repulsions from each other. And so in SGEMS, you can do that with a, a tool that's called TI Generator. So the TI Generator is a tool that simulates uh, objects and um, where you can specify the, the object type, such as the sinusoid uh, object type, which is the one that is simulated over here. So um, you can specify the dimensions of the object, such as length, width, and thickness. So here we then we have generated our training image. And remember, our training image is, is, is 3D. OK. What about the probability map? Um, well, the, or the probability cube. So what we're doing here is we're using our seismic amplitude data and we do logistic regression. So what we do is, and remember, uh, when we looked at our lecture on spatial data aggregation and also in your homework on, this, on the landslide uh, mapping, is that we used a template, scan that, that, uh, that, um, that data, for example, here, the amplitude data, and do principal component analysis and then lo do logistic regression on the principal component analysis. And that's exactly what is done here. So once we've done that logistic regression, uh, we come out with a sand probability and the uh, shale probability. And so here we see the sand probability. Uh, it looks a little noisy, that's because of the noise of the data. And so we smooth that out a little bit to get a better idea of what this probability looks like. We observe here is there's a fault over here. Uh, what we also notice is that there's sort of a canyon where you see a large concentration of sand. And then outside the canyon, we have a smaller concentration of sand. OK, so then we can generate multiple uh, realizations. So we have realizations of our uh, hard data. With our hard data only means wells only. Here we have a realization uh, that has both uh, the point data, the well data, as well as that soft probability map, which is this probability map here that I've shown before. And so what we notice is that, indeed, what we, what we get is what we desire. We get this long continuous channels. Uh, we have areas like here and there where you have almost no sand so we don't generate any sand there and so we get a nice 3d uh, continuity of that sand body so the previous method uh, works really well for categorical variables becomes infeasible for continuous variables and the reason for that is that the search tree is um, is mostly dependent on the number of categories that you specify so when we have a continuous variable and it goes to start dis discretizing that variable into many categories and that simply no longer becomes feasible. So 
So a new method was developed uh, by uh, Gregor Marito on the idea of direct sampling. And that work follows on the work of uh, Claude Shannon. So no, right now in this uh, new method of direct sampling, we'll no longer be building probability models. Um, and because probability models, in order to do that and building condition probability models, there are many, many combinatorials we have to go to. So the idea of Claude Shannon was that instead of doing uh, drawing from a probability model, just draw directly from the training set. So for example, imagine you have a book with letters and you'd like to uh, draw from the univariate distribution of the frequency of letters. One way of doing that is just going through the entire book and doing counting uh, and then coming up with frequencies and then using those frequencies to do Monte Carlo. The Claude Shannon said that that's not really needed. What we need to do is just randomly pick a letter and then we have a sample. Well, let's not forget that the idea of uh, simulation is not probability models, it's actually the samples. So why not just cut directly to the samples? And this is a, quite a powerful idea. When I was in Grigard's uh, PhD dissertation, I thought this example he gave was really nice illustration. Suppose you have a French text and a whole French book, and suppose now you don't know any French, but you'd like to make more French books um, by writing automatically or, uh, or creating a computer program that can write French books. How would you do that? So we can make probability models of Markov chains. For example, we can model uh, Markov chain dependencies and do auto regression and all these kind of things, but they all rely on probability models that are going to be difficult to apply to the simple context uh, of, of, or to the more complicated context that we have here. So the way it's done is as follows. So suppose I've written already two letters. And then the question is, what's the, what's the next letter? So the way, way we do it is use the Shannon concept. And in the Shannon concept, uh, remember, we're going to randomly select a location. So imagine I take that location here, and I find the letter A and I, and so that doesn't match my P and A. So and then I randomly take another location. For example, this location, nothing there and so on. And so at some point, uh, I will find a match and uh, and then I will take the next letter simply. So I'm not in modeling any probabilities. Take the letter R, so that would be my next letter, and paste that next to it. And so I have P-A-R. If I take a simulation of order three, what I would then do is I would forget about the P and I'll only work with the A-R. And so that would again be scanning uh, my um, my set here in order to find something uh, that, that's that. So here I find one, and so what I do is I take that letter again, and I put it there, and again, I forget about PA, et cetera. So what we're going to do is, of course, not take uh, samples of order three, but uh, if you large enough, um, then we'll find something, uh, and so on, by the way. So if you large enough, then we'll find something after 13 that looks like French. You see, I get French works like Nouveau and Fromage, uh, Fenêtre, Ouverte, Nuit, Tranquille, etc. Okay, so that sounds like a really neat idea. So um, how does that work in, in that space? It works exactly the same way. So now we don't have letters, but we have essentially uh, simulated uh, values or values of categories. So I mentioned that I have this neighborhood. So what I do is I go find, uh, Try to again go on a random location, just like the random location for the letters, and see whether my template matches. So what I have here is a red, a blue, and a green. So this is not matching uh, because the blue and the green are not matched. And so I take randomly another location, not matching, another location, and then I find a match. So what I then simply do is uh, I take that value the red value there, and I paste that into my simulation grid, and I've now simulated a value. So you notice there's no dealing here with probability uh, values or models. So of course, in reality, uh, what you're going to get, just like in the previous case, is you may have, a, a, once your neighborhood starts to be more complicated and you have more sample points, then you may not find an exact match. So what we then do is we define a distance. And we take that um, event that has a distance smaller than a user-specified distance. What, what we show here, what we do is we create a distance between the neighborhood uh, created from the domain. So in the domain, I have uh, vectors of lag distances and I have values that are the value sample values and I'm in a location of interest. 
So I like to find these distances between the domain of interest and the training image. So that is basically the notation here. Uh, it looks very much like when we're talking about paragraph, we have these lag specifications, but now I look at all the lag specifications together, not just two at a time. So the main, uh, therefore, the main um, parameters in DS are three parameters. One is the specification of the distance, so you can work with that in categorical values and um, uh, discrete values or continuous variable, probably using different distances. The threshold that you specify beyond which uh, you'll select the one, so you will stop the search once you have one. In the fraction of the training image you scan. So, for example, we don't want to be scanning uh, the entire training image and waiting for the last node to find the best one. So, we'll just usually scan, say, 30 or 40 percent of the training image. So, of course, these T and this F will determine uh, the speed of, of, of the algorithm. So, that's basically it for that. And so, then I can simulate, as you notice, very complicated structures. Uh, here you have your cobblestones, this is your training image, and here's the simulation grid. And at the same time, I can also constrain to the data because what we're doing here is sequential simulation, so it works exactly as before. I paste my values into the simulation grid, and I don't visit them, but I account for them as I'm doing my simulation. You can do many things with this. Um, you can uh, take very small training images and create uh, very big uh, realizations. And so uh, this reminds us a little bit about computer graphics in particular. For example, this is used often in texture synthesis and texture analysis. And so uh, in our MPS book, we have many of examples of that you can uh, do texture synthesis with this kind of uh, basic method. What if you have many uh, variables? Well, then you would have many training images. Just as before, in the first case I showed you, we had a training image and we had soft probability. So what if you have now, instead of that, you have many of these variables? So what you now have is not a distance between just two variables, uh, between variables in the training image of one training image, you, but you have many training images and many variables uh, that you have to calculate distance. So you would just average the distance over the various uh, categories. And I refer to the MPS book for how exactly uh, that will work. So here's an example. I think it's a really cool example um, that Gregor worked out and uh, has to do with climate model downscaling. So what we have here, we're in Australia. Uh, we have a map of temperature, soil moisture, and latent heat at a very high resolution uh, that is obtained, say, with a climate model. And so if you look at the relationship between all these variables, they're very complicated. They're not linear. They are not Gaussian. Uh, they have very complicated relationships. So this is uh, the scatter plot between just two variables. So to go and model this uh, three-dimensional multivariate relationship plus a spatial component to it and use cross variograms is just a nightmare and it's not going to give you good results. So the idea that was done here in this particular application, which you'll find in the MPS book, is that in, re in reality, climate modeling happens at a much coarser scale, while the use of climate models would be useful at a much finer scale. Say, for example, you'd like to use this for agricultural modeling or models or uh, watershed modeling, uh, then the climate models need to be downscaled on a much uh, finer scale uh, in order for you to do, uh, to do your analysis. And so what was done here is that we used the climate models from the period of 1985 to 2005 and then uh, where we had both the coarse resolution as well as the fine resolution, we trained our system. So again, there's no convolutional neural network or deep learning or any of these methods. It's, it's basically using these as training images and direct sampling and directly sampling uh, values uh, to, uh, to create new models. What we then will do is for the period after 2005, we won't be generating the fine scale anymore. This is computationally too, uh, too demanding. We'll use these relationships to directly downscale in a statistical fashion now these core scale models into fine scale models. So that is done here. So for example, just for the year 2006, uh, we're going to downscale without a physical model. And so to do that is we have here the predicted uh, model from the downscale one. And of course, we can also compare that with the, if you would calculate the physical model, which you of course do for comparison, uh, this is the actual physical model and see that you get really uh, very similar patterns uh, in these models that will provide you um, some uh, nice uh, downscale models. What's also very nice is that this downscaling is non-unique. Uh, so with this method, you can also qu quantify uncertainty by running more 
of these uh, models and creating multiple realizations.